Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show to V with Mike G, the show of life, the show of Mescal, the show of translating, the show of Ohio, and so much more. Today's guest is the brilliant Jason Paul Cox. You might have heard of Cinco Sentidos Mescal and the amazing culinary establishment in Oaxaca, El Destilado. At this point, when I was interviewing Jason, we didn't really know each other very well. But over the past few months, I can say that I've traveled with him a little bit, spent some time with him in Oaxaca, and tried even more of the delicious mezcales or destilado de agave from Cinco Sentidos. Not a lot about Jason on the web. If you're sitting at a bar with him, you learn a whole lot. But I hope this conversation really serves as an insight into the man himself, the very, very compassionate and intelligent Man. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this great chat with Jason Paul Cox. No, oh, my mom is a nurse. Okay. Um, so I think they're compassionate side of them. So yeah. Bit, you know, caring for others. Yeah. Making sure that they're that they're doing okay. Um, and then my dad. Uh, he, uh, he passed away a few years ago, but mm. he uh, worked in logistics. Okay. He ran a trucking company. No kidding. Um, so two very different, uh, two different very... Left brain, right brain. Yeah, exactly. Poles, if you will. Yeah. Um, but I definitely think that's what I pick up from my mom is uh, someone who's just always aware of how of everyone else's well-being and attentive to, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, attentive to how they're doing at the end of the day. So it seems like it's been a very serpentine journey to get here. Now you're, you know, in your early 30s, so it's like you, at least, at least the way I perceive it, is you've had a great level of success in your your encounters so far, right? But this starts, Fort Wayne, is that where you grew up in Indiana? Yeah, I was born and raised in Fort Wayne, Indiana. What kinds of things did you aspire to then? Because I think about, <laughs> moment, like we were talking about this the other night, my dad's from Bloomington. I've been to Bloomington. There's not a lot of stuff in Bloomington, and I was a kid. But my dad kind of somehow carved his own path in the restaurant business, you know. But for you, you seem like you're very educated and very, very intelligent. Did you want to go into the arts? Did you feel like going into math? Anything real predetermined for you? Mm-hmm. I grew up in the... I started... I had like a political coming of age in the Bush era. Yeah. Bush two. Yeah, yeah. And uh, my dad was someone who was really outspoken about his political beliefs. And mm. um, I was very attentive to what I thought the path our country is on, if that makes sense. Sure, and sure. and uh, certainly picked up a sense of what I thought was right or wrong and a sense of justice from from my dad, you know. Yeah. Even though that's not something he worked in, it was something that was, you know, discussed at dinner almost on a nightly basis. Oh no you kidding. Know, what's happening in the world. So But the, the whole family the, yeah, kind yeah. of talking that's interesting to have that um, dialogue. I think that's great. And uh, so I've always been kind of a current events junkie. Um, that led me to study first at a, a school called Wabash College in mm. Southern Indiana. Um, I did a year there, and Wabash. How was it? Is, I'm sorry. How was it? Are you familiar with Wabash? I'm not. It is the only all male higher ed institution oh, still man. in the United States. Really? Uh, of all the places. Yeah, Southern Crawfordsville, Indiana. Um, which uh, the the irony is, it's actually really like a really good education i mean mm-hmm. academically incredibly rigorous yeah um, no distractions exactly <laughs> that's the way that it's uh it's 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 sold you know and that was yeah. what i when i was 18 years old i needed something like that uh to be to someone to force me to engage i mean i like the liberal arts style of, of education where right. you're in classes of 24 people and if you didn't do your reading you're going to get called out because you have to defend a thesis day in and day out sure um but that was also a situation where I wasn't getting a social education, yeah. you know. Um, being in a bubble like that wasn't a reflection of the real world that I was wanted to, that I was going to become a part of. Sure, and somehow very connected to as well, right? Because there's that academic bubble, but then there's the larger causes for people and communities and things. Right, right. Um, so I, I moved to uh, moved to, to Granville, Ohio. I think I've gone off the rail on your question here. No, it's uh, fine. <laughs> um. 
But I went, yeah, so basically what was I trying to do? Um, when I went to Granville to, uh, to study at Denison, I picked up a, a triple major program called PPE. It's a, it's a British style education where you combine oh. politics, philosophy, and, and economics um, with the intention essentially of, of working in politics or, or academics or mm. academia, you know, probably the idea was to work on, a, on probably a local level for politics, mm. um, maybe nonprofits, and then uh, eventually settle into academia and teach people what I, what I learned. Um, I interned in the Senate uh, between junior and senior year. Really? And uh, was realized, well, shit, I can't change my major now, but I do not <laughs> want to be involved in politics. How did that feel? Because oddly enough, Leslie, who we met the other night, she worked for the Senate too. Yeah. And she's so bur- she got her major in it politics and public policy and stuff and then after just a few years i think three or four years she's like fuck this man yeah how how does it feel does it she lost a little bit of hope i'll put it that way for you was it kind of the same thing that maybe the way that things actually work and what you're trying to do that those are disparate yeah i think that's that's what it came down to and 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 i I, and i learned um what a monolith you know the system is yeah right Uh, I think one of the things that I thought was so frustrating, and, and this sounds really weird or petty, but it was kind of like the example of how ingrained these things are. Is the exact phrase, if I, if I remember, it's like basically like the power of the, 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 the power of the post, power of the post office. So the Senate can send out oh, anything right. for free. Yeah. So you have interns that are basically in cubicles all day, um, auto pen signing congratulatory letters from your congressman or your senator. Yeah. You know things that no one actually reads or considers or talks about, but it was one of these ideas that if you're an incumbent, um, you can keep a grasp on your constituents and you have all the voter rolls and you have all the addresses and just mm-hmm. send out mass mailings of like, and and basically feign engagement. Oh man, um, spam and, people. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, right yeah, like in a very like, analog way. Yeah, and it's like you know, but who doesn't get excited about getting spammed from you know Senator Dick Luger? Right, um, right. It's like that's a pretty that's exciting a, thing to get in the mail, sure. especially if you're a 14 year old or you're 16, and mm-hmm. it's about something you did at high school and you're going to be voting age in a couple of years. Yeah, um, and I was just like, man, I don't, I don't. What I want to do, I'm not going to do it in the confines of of this type of. Um, structure at yeah. the end of the day and i'm much and i'm an independent person too um so i couldn't see working as a legislative age for 10 years to kind of eventually have somewhat of a voice in the senate's office and hopefully the power or the party stays in power etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah um that doesn't sound particularly appealing like it no feels, uh, let's put it this, intellectually it seems quite stifling right because you you talk about confines we already discuss politics in two ways left right that's it right there's no middle of this so i can't imagine that you can even grow intellectually in that kind of place um i couldn't you, that doesn't yeah. mean that other people can't sure. um, and i have a lot of respect for people who are politically engaged and and work hard to get where they're at yeah. um but it's you know fortunately at that time at that age i was getting to know myself um mm-hmm. and i think that happens in different stages of different of everyone's life at different course, times yeah um so coming back from there i was like wow i don't i don't want to do this i don't know what i want to do um i did a lot of civic engagement stuff my senior year of college mm. and um also lived off the grid um like i lived in a like a sustain how would you say this it's basically like it wasn't sustainable community but its aims were towards sustainability yeah um so it was a, a planned community called the homestead uh, which is part of the denison university um so i lived with there with nine or i'm sorry 11 other people and three different cabins and we drew all our you know our lights from solar power if we wanted wow. fire we'd chop wood and build a fireplace and um you know uh, had a gar- veg- garden and stuff too mm-hmm. oh yeah big garden had to adapt to, uh, to a vegetarian diet to live there mm. um and there was a lot of you know, I remember. I'll never forget. There's like a big sign in the in the community kitchen there, which says "Reject Convenience." Yeah. Oh wow. Um, and I mean, you can you can see how much that can translate to what I'm doing today. I mean, it's almost a direct conduit to it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Did, but so having so this is the thing. I feel like there there'd be a little bit of an internal dialogue and maybe some conflict where you're pushing yourself to do this thing that, for all intents and purposes, is quite a positive thing live off the grid, use what you can, sustain solar energy, eat what you make, which I think is an amazing sentiment. But at the same time, 
did you feel like you still had this wanderlust for something bigger, maybe something more metropolitan? Um, you know, I think when I fast forward a couple of years and I've just finished doing the Peace Corps in Panama and the only goal that I had in my life was like, oh, I want to live in New York City before I'm 30. Yeah. In some context or another. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm definitely drawn to big cities and, and high energy and uh, the human ecosystem. Yeah. You know, right. I, I, I really draw a lot. I'm just seeing people walk quickly and get to where they're going. And mm -hmm. I, I love getting on a metro no matter where I'm at in the world. Uh, so yeah, I think there was a cosmetol. There's always been a cosmetolitan and ambition. Mm. Um, I'm drawn to, to that. Um, but that was a good time. I mean, it was a, it, there were incredible friendships that I that I forged there and and maintained there because they were my friends before they invited me to live. Yeah, at that space. And um, yeah, I mean, I look back at that those days really. I mean, it's, that's tough in it, and I think in a very good way. But I don't know a lot of us could do that. It, yeah, I think it was also, it ended up working really well in the sense that it prepared me mentally and, and physically to be a Peace Corps volunteer, um, which is something that I applied for um, right after graduating. Oh, yeah. And uh, Panama was the first assignment? Yeah, Panama was the, uh, so, so I, I was in Panama for just over two years in a sliver, Yeah. Um, which is a really exciting and fun place to live That's and great. really set my mentality for, from a my 20s and the rest of my life i'm getting to know campesinos uh people who often lived um you know hand to mouth and, mm -hmm. and basically the food that they plant and they harvest is what's going to be on the table um there's a lot of corollary or a lot of yeah, there's a lot in common with what uh, the, the farmers i get to work with in mexico are doing i mean I'm, now this is all making more sense you know <laughs> because there's a little bit of a dark area in the the web if you will but not dark web but there's not a lot about what brought you to this place you know i think that it's really important to think about because now i understand my maybe why you're so engaged with food and all of that so panama two and a, two and a sliver you say mm -hmm. did you get your metropolitan stuff in did no. You, no, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no 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 panama no no um but you can't do everything right yeah um what was the next move then from there so the next move was um you know, like every, like most Peace Corps volunteers, mm -hmm. move back home to mom and dad. Yeah, um, you know who are they were glad to have you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, really cool. One, of, I think one of the most, um, to me, the best family vacation I ever had too was right on the end of that trip where um, I, I, I bust up to Nicaragua mm -hmm. and met my mom and dad there, and it's the first time either of them had left the country. Oh, that's crazy! So we did like a twelve-day Nicaragua road trip. Wow, um, of all places too, right? Yeah, it, it was something you know. I was ready to leave Panama when it was time to leave Panama. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to have the adventure of discovering something new with my family as mm -hmm. opposed to let me take you to places that I've been to. Um, so Nicaragua was something, I mean, obviously, I'm bringing my family down to Central America for yeah. the first time. And they're, they're both in their 60s and they've never left the country. And it's mm -hmm. like, I researched it really extensively. I put a lot of thought and time into it. I wanted to see what they wanted to do. And really cool, really beautiful experience. And it's that amazing. was a neat thing to do. Then send them back on the plane, keep going up Central America, oh. hit Honduras, um, yeah, was spent a bit of time in Guatemala and then back home. Um, so I'm you know, I'm home for five days and I think you could probably tell at this point I don't feel comfortable not working. Yeah. Um so Or doing something, helping, whatever, right? Gotta do something, you know, I've gotta be engaged, I've gotta be moving, I've gotta be working towards something. Yeah. And at that point in time I had known that I was gonna have a uh, a job for me in Spain, which is going to start in, uh, working as an English educator. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so uh, I get home around mid-March. I've got less, a little less than six months, and I'm like, I got to do something, you know? Yeah. So I go to Indeed.com, and I type in <laughs> Speak Spanish. And one of the first things that pops up is a, um, a medical interpreting. And I'm like, I don't know if I have the chops for this but right. i did teach sexual health when i was in panama I, i'm familiar with the human biology yeah um i started investigating what the requirements are what this looks like and um i started studying you know i just start i, I pick up uh, I, I order the books and yeah. i start uh just basically quizzing myself day in and day out for about a week just bio uh, anatomy type stuff anatomy medical terms medical yeah. uh, you know tools if sure, you will sure. um 
illnesses, et cetera, what you would need to know basically to get by in the hospital. Mm. Um, fortunately, most medical care providers, when they speak to a patient, they also talk to things in layman's terms. It's, mm -hmm. it's oftentimes someone's first go around with an, an obscure disease, you know? Right, right. Um, you want to soften it, make it very, you have to make it simple for people to understand because otherwise you frighten them, overwhelm them. So. Right. And um, uh, I give it a shot. I, I, I drive down to Columbus, Ohio. I, I, I interview with them. My intention is to be there for four or five months yeah. only, but of course I don't reveal that. Um, and uh, I take a test on the site. I get hear back from a couple of days later, and they're like, all right, come to training, and you're in. No way. And yeah, I felt comfortable in a medical scenario. You know, my mom's a nurse, mm -hmm. um, and when I was growing up, my dad was sick a lot. You know, Honestly, I spent a lot of time visiting my dad in the hospital. Um, what, uh, pre existing condition? What exactly? Um, I mean, he, he had a lot going on, yeah. to, to, to put it that way. Sure. And, uh, uh, from when I was about maybe 8 to 10 years old until he, he passed away when I was 25 yeah. or 26. Um, he was, he was uh, not always medically stable. Yeah. But when he was 15, or when, no, when he was 15, I was 15, he was a recipient of a double organ transplant. Wow. Um, so both kidney and liver. And uh, at that time, um, you know, he recovered really well. He was really sick going into that. Yeah. And um, well, the doctors essentially told him, you know, you'll be lucky if you get another five years out of this. Mm -hmm. um, and he got 11. Amazing. Um, and, uh, and those were mostly really, really good years for him and his health. Yeah. Um, and, and Nicaragua, which is cool. Yeah. It's yeah. a great, great way to do it. It's a, you know, no one knew that at the time. I mean, he passed yeah. away seven months after that trip. Oh my gosh. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a, it's pretty crazy to think that that was, you know, one of his last hurrahs, if you will. Yeah. But I mean, that, you know, just a brief aside, that's got to feel finally like everybody got to connect in this place and they've never been outside the States. I mean, that's an amazing homage to him. Right? Yeah. And to his life in, in a sense. So you get this job, don't anticipate being there, but for four or five months, you said it's something like yeah. that. And so how was the experience talking to patients? I loved it. Yeah. Um, I really did. Um, I, it was something that I was really happy. Uh, let me rephrase that. I ended up staying in Columbus longer than I expected, precisely because oh. my dad's health went downhill. Yeah. So I, I didn't go to Spain. Um, I stayed uh, in interpreting. And it was incredible. I mean, it uh, Ironically enough, about three years previous, I'd visited a friend in Spain um, before going to Panama, and my mm -hmm. Spanish was still really, really bad. Mm -hmm. um, I got food poisoning. I got really sick. Oh. Um, I, I, I lost consciousness when I was on a hike, and I woke up in an emergency room. Oh, shit. Was anybody with you? Um, like? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. yeah okay, fortunately, okay. yeah. Um, but I woke up in the emergency room, and uh, the friend I was visiting, she was away mm. and when I came to, and all of a sudden, I'm like, what the? I'm in a hospital. Hmm. I don't know where I'm at. I don't know why I'm here. Um, you know, I'm starting to come to, and I remember I was retching in the waiting room and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like, you know, basically like, help me, please. Mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't communicate. I, my Spanish was really poor at that time. Uh, this, is, this is pre Panama. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll never forget that feeling of impotence and, and, and being lost until, fortunately, you know, a doctor came over and started talking to me. I didn't understand anything. Um, you know, I'm freaking out about like, I don't have money to pay for this. I don't yeah. know why I'm here. Um, Disoriented and, in every kind of way, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then shortly afterwards, fortunately, um, and she's still a dear friend. My friend Hannah came and was like, hey, I'm here. And, and she, she was a, my interpreter. Oh my gosh. Um, that comes full circle. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, it was something that like when I didn't, I didn't even have an idea until I was living it. You know, I was doing it. And I was like, "Oh my God, mm. I I know exactly what this poor lady is feeling, or what this poor young man is feeling." And um, in a year and a half's time of doing that job, I saw everything. Um, wow. You know, I I translated or interpreted for two or three births. Um, mm -hmm. I had, had to inform families that their loved one was not going to make it. Right. Um, go to physical therapy appointments, the common cold, um, the mental health, which yeah. was particularly fascinating. Um, were you down emotionally good news bad news alike i'm sorry did it wear you down um that didn't wear me down what i did afterwards wore me down mm -hmm. um uh, i i switched into after doing that for a while i started working with a mobile outreach clinic mm -hmm. and uh it was a, a part-time bilingual caseworker um so i mostly i did like mental health uh, in, uh 
appointments yeah. um, for, for Hispanic patients. Um, but I also helped the general populace, which was was homeless. I mean, mm-hmm. they were they were particularly going to homeless populations and, and underserved communities. And after doing that for six or seven months, um, someone in that team was like, "Hey, you, I know that you're pursuing interpreting, right? And but you really work well with people, and you have a lot of patience. And we have this um, job opportunity for you, which is um, called a SOAR coordinator. So SOAR stands for SSI, SSDI, Outreach, Access, and Recovery. Okay." Um, Basically, the intention of this uh, federal grant is to um, achieve, basically prove that the people I'm working with have a disability yeah. so we can secure an income and then place them in housing. Um, on average, you do 15 to 20 hours of interview with each person, each one of your clients. Wow, okay. Um, and then afterwards, follow through to get them in housing. Mm-hmm. So my population was a 100% um, homeless people with mental health issues. Oh, jeez. Um, and oftentimes had drug abuse issues. Right. Um, Dangerous at times? Violence? I think I only felt um, unsafe once okay. in that year, and that was of my own doing. It was something that was definitely, like, I agreed to a meeting at a place where I shouldn't have agreed to. It was totally oh, not acceptable, like, by the company guidelines. Sure. But it was also like, okay, I've been trying to get this young man help for a long time. He really needs it. I'm going to go to him. Even if that means it's not a, a necessarily the safest place to right. go finish our paperwork and have you sign, you know. Um, but I've had, I mean, I've had people spill their darkest demons, um, and it's oftentimes they're at the lowest place in their life. Right. Um, and and my job is to be a scribe. I'm sitting here asking questions and typing and and, yeah. and, and documenting all this. And fortunately, it was something that that most of the people I worked with were a great success. Um, yeah. A lot of people we we secured their benefits. A few people we secured housing for them but after around a year um uh, and simultaneously i'm studying for legal interpreting i want to get courtroom certified okay i'm still picking up shifts sometimes on the weekends to go on call interpreting at hospitals Mm -hmm. just to keep using my language um and i just i had to go you know Mm -hmm. after about a year i was just saying man this is this is a little too much how so uh, you know coming home uh, for me too i mean the concept and the dynamic of what is ultimately counseling now you're being pretty objective you're just pulling information but all the time that comes with an emotional anchor you know an emotional kind of weight to it how are you working through that stuff not purging is the wrong word but just kind of like dealing with it when you got home is it's like being around people relaxing for you you know everything's off lights off no Technology, what exactly were you? Uh, it was being with, with people. Yeah. Um, Columbus at that time, I was part of a really cool community. Um, some of my friends were running a, um, a community garden. Oh, cool. um, so it was like a cool thing to go hang out, whether or not participating in the actual garden itself. There sure. was there were always people around. There were always friends. There was always a good attitude, good yeah. good vibe. Uh, and I played intramural basketball as well. Oh, you there know. you go. You're tall. Gotta go compete, <laughs> right? Exactly. I'm tall. That's what, what are I'm, you, forward or point guard? uh well in oaxaca man i'm a center now but uh <laughs> i'd like to I'd like to consider myself a small forward <laughs> but uh that's one of the but yeah yeah that's funny so you're really too much and i could understand the weight's building it's very very emotionally dark what, so how do you what's the palate cleanser for you then at that point um I'm not sure it was a palate cleanser, but uh, I mean, it was. It, it came to a breaking point. Yeah. You know, I I, I broke down one day, mm-hmm. and uh, and I I you know I basically put in my two weeks on the spot, and it wasn't something that I turned around very much, and uh, and I don't think I gave my two. You know, I ended up doing a month or something. Sure. I wanted to finish out my cases, but yeah. um, you know, I, I essentially had to say, hey, I'm I've given this my best, yeah. um, but I don't I don't have the tools to do this um, for the long term. And, um, you know, so, so, so I, I stopped working with, um, Mount Carmel was the hospital group's name. And I had a few weeks, I had about six weeks before this, um, uh, interpreting certification exam mm-hmm. was coming up. And this, this is the type of exam that you need to pass to start doing trial certification. Mm-hmm. So the simultaneous, uh, sort of, uh, type of interpreting where you're input and output at the same time, mm. the judge is speaking at 160 words per minute. I'm listening and I'm outputting that in mm-hmm. Spanish. Um, 
that was something that I also did every day after work, you know, for about an hour, an hour and a half. Just go practice, home. Practice, practice, right? Listen to testimonies, record myself, write down my errors, listen to myself. Um, it was actually really, um, the process of interpreting is incredible. Mm. Um, you actually, as an interpreter, you can be called upon to testify in the future if you make an error. And oh. a, a very legitimate um you can say you can literally say I cannot recall because you're incapable of really retaining sure what you're processing. Yeah, would, uh, totally impromptu. Just uh, I'm trying to think of the word. Just super on the on the the spot. Like that's it. Mm -hmm. Spontaneous. There you go. So it's just like in out in out in out. It's spontaneous and it's ephemeral. You know, it's yeah. something that you process it and you leave it when you're doing simultaneous. Um, consecutive interpreting is something that you hear and then you're supposed to retain it because mm -hmm. you want to give someone up to thirty seconds of utterances. Yeah, you're capturing it and then you're repeating it. So it, it, it's actually something that is, you know, you you remember it, yeah. Um, but you don't when it's simultaneous. It's crazy. And then so I can't recall finally, truthfully, in an ethical way, <laughs> yeah. instead of just be like, ah, you know, um, they don't want to talk about it. I thought it was funny that something like that came up in the, uh, not to take this, not to go oh, too no, far left turn, but uh, that's something that happened with the Chapo trial recently that they were like, they were trying to, they were rolling, they were ripping through interpreters. I didn't know that. Because all these guys are nervous. Oh, fuck. You know? And they're like, they're, and what, I mean, one of his, uh, one of his, uh, someone who was testifying, and I don't remember if it was uh, for or against the defense, finally was like, hey, I speak English. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this. Like, the interpreter is messing things up. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> which is like the biggest nightmare. You know, yeah. I never even did it. I ended up not doing any court courtroom interpreting. Yeah. But that's like the thing that you're always facing when you're studying for this and you're going to the seminars and the classwork. It's like, you can't fuck this up. Yeah. There's a lot on the line. Dude. Um, anyway, so studying for that, I've got six weeks before my exam and then I've been plowing, you know, getting preparing this for about a year. Sure, sure. I go, well, what's the best way to prepare for this exam apart from going to Mexico? You know, that's where most of the, the clients I'm working with are from. Mm -hmm. I learned Spanish in Panama. I've learned through my patients uh, in, in the Ohio health system that I don't, uh, I don't speak Mexicanismos. Ah. You know, I don't know all the slang. I should go down to Mexico. I'm going to look for a language school. I'm going to hire someone to basically help me study and prepare. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to learn you know, Espanol Oaxaqueño, Mexicano. Yeah. Um, I look at three different language schools. Can't, I'm not going to lie to you, Mike. Uh, I chose Oaxaca because it was the cheapest. <laughs> it, well, yeah. that's fair, man. And it was like 80 bucks cheaper. Um, that's a lot. You know, mean, that's and a I lot, started, yeah. uh, You know, and I started looking at, obviously I looked at the other reasons too. You know, I mean, yeah. I started looking at, uh, as soon as I started reading about Oaxaca, I have an aunt, um, I have an auntie, uh, Melinda, who always is always traveled to Oaxaca a lot. Oh, she really? spoke to me a lot about Oaxaca. Um, and the rebel in me, it was like, well, I don't want to go to Oaxaca and follow her footsteps. Yeah. But I started reading about it. I'm like, this is pretty cool, you know? And uh, I, I guess I'll go there over Mexico City or Guanajuato. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, Dude, that's where that's where chapter, you know, 11 begins, essentially. I can't. That It makes so much sense. But it's just happenstance. You know what I mean? Like the fact you, and, <laughs> I love that you're a thrifty guy. I think that... <laughs> <laughs> I think that makes a lot of sense. That's paid and off. Honest, honestly, <laughs> that's a you know when you talk about mezcal versus destilado de agave, thriftiness is another thread for you. But we'll talk about that in a second. But yeah. so, how do you get involved with being then a restaurateur? Which again, you may consider that too strong of a term. But here are the things we know so far. Right, very much know about land, land, and living off the land and farming and stuff like that right and so you feel comfortable with raw ingredients i think you're probably very comfortable with the process of raw ingredients so how does this kind of formalize into a restaurant and you didn't ever leave did you you went down to the language school did you come back i did for about six weeks that's not a um, lot <laughs> yeah well i make it to oaxaca and um on day one i meet uh joseph gilbert who's my mm -hmm. business partner in the restaurant and our brand day one where'd you guys meet uh he was at the same language school as i was no kidding so we meet uh, at our homestay and um you know i think it's day two he's like i'm gonna go to a mezcal tasting do you want to come never heard of mezcal yeah were What's you mezcal? even drinking at all at that um point? i liked craft beer okay. you know i just started getting into whiskey a little bit yeah uh, there was like a little whiskey bar down the street from me called barrel 44 in oh, columbus yeah. that i would uh check out spot, and, yeah because um, you're like what mid-20s here yeah, 26, 25 at that okay. point. 25 at that yeah. point. Yeah. Wow. Excuse me. 26, 25. Who knows? Time flies. Um, yeah. 
And uh, that tasting ended up being hosted by Judah Cooper. It's at a restaurant called La Oya. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, first sip, I got a lot. I'm not, you know, I got to tell you the truth, man. It's like 52% Tobala from Tokyo the rain. Balls, and it's man. like, yeah. whoa, this is some crazy fire water that everyone's very excited about. Uh-huh. Um, but I, I, I see the photos and I hear the story that you're just telling, which is, as you know, it's a really incredible story. Mm-hmm. The passion and, and it's engaging. And it's immediately the type of thing where I'm going, wow, okay. Um, you know, in my spare time in Columbus, which I didn't have a ton, I was running a farmer's market um, and I participated in a CSA. Mm. And here we are talking about, I've always been interested in, in consuming and knowing who has their hands on what I consume. Right. And we're going, okay, this is a guy who's making really incredible potent booze in his backyard. Yeah. You know, this is your organic farmer, uh, but in, in a different way. Um, so that night, um, Joseph, Judah, David Castillo, um, a couple of the people, we go to, um, a really legendary speakeasy that's now closed in Oaxaca called Piedra Lumbre. Oh yeah. I remember that place. And it's just, I love that place. Um, and just, you know, mezcal after mezcal and, uh, nothing excessive, but you know, all of a sudden I'm geeking out. Like my first approach was like, man, this is tough. And by the end of the night, I'm like, this is fascinating. Oh man. And I, I think I remember, um, so here's something about me is that, that um, I've never been a big drinker. Um, I really feel the effects of it the next day, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's beer, whether it's wine, cocktails. Yeah. Um, I really can't um, consume too much. And um, Even as a center on the Oaxacan basketball team. If anybody could just. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's, it's one of my, my weak spots, I yeah. guess. But, uh, Achilles heels. I wake up the next day and, I, and I, you know, I mentioned that you know, over a late breakfast at our homestay. And I'm like, man, we drank a lot last night, but I don't have a hangover. Yeah. And Joseph's like, yeah, man, you don't get, Mescal doesn't give you hangovers. I'm like, no, no way. Like, well, you don't have a hangover, do you? I'm like, yeah. Well, you know, and it was almost like, okay, this is magical. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but I, at this point, I haven't detracted from my, my goal, right? I'm still right. there to study. I'm doing about eight hours of study a day. I'm going out to Mescaleries at night. You know, I end up leaving clothes behind to buy bottles. And uh, when I get back to Columbus, uh, I, I, mean, I think probably my friends there probably like re- recount this like weird interval where I come back from Mexico and I'm mm-hmm. present for another six weeks and then I just disappear. Yeah. But I'm present because I've got mezcal and I've nerded out about it and I want to yeah. share it with people. And I'm like, you got to try this. You got to try that. Um, I remember going to a Columbus crew game, right? In like the early, like early December. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, where I'll get like, you know, we have a flask of mezcal and we're like, man, this is incredible. You know, yeah. like, this incredible booze and uh, you feel great. And um, I kind of got ahead of myself there. The two days after getting back from Oaxaca, I present my exam. It's an it's an oral exam. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like some you know it's a recorded exam essentially. Sure. And I'm positive that I failed, and I think that I failed because of um, my dominion of slang oh. wasn't good enough. So I've got in the back of my head. All right, the next exam is in April, six months from now. Yeah. Um, I don't have a job because I quit. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go back to Oaxaca. I'm going to keep learning about this great mezcal. I'm going to try to get a job in a mezcal bar, and I'm going to work as a bartender so I can learn slang. Yeah, I want to speak wow. informal Spanish. Um, so I bought my ticket. To, I get into Oaxaca on December 31st. Mm-hmm. You know, like very symbol- symbolic too, and dude, tied you know, right on time for New Year's. Sure. And, and uh, I get my congratulatory letter in the mail oh, December 26th. Gosh, what? Uh, but I get this thing called, I, mean, I get a letter saying, congratulations, you posted a 64. You're supposed to get a 70 to be certified, but you're what's called provisionally qualified if you okay. get a 60. And yeah. it's saying, look, we're going to let you work for a year, but you got to come back and do better. Mm. And I was like, dude, I don't want to be a half-assed interpreter, right? Like, yeah, you know, I don't yeah. want to be that dude who is like the last guy in the register <laughs> because he's always flubbing <laughs> things up and you got like right. a mistrial, you know? Yeah. So I was like, you know, I'm going to keep going back. I'm going to study and I'm going to do this right six months from now and be better. Yeah. I started working La Mescalarita almost day one, you know, hit the ground there. I went there for New Year's Eve. Do you guys need an English speaking bartender? Yeah. I'd like to learn about mezcal, you know, and uh, they're really gracious. I'm really, really appreciative, really gracious that they let me be part of their team for a few months. Yeah. And uh, at that time, my, my business partner, Joseph, he's he's working at Origen, um, oh, yeah. which is, which is probably restaurant. my favorite restaurant in, in Oaxaca. Yeah. 
And you know how industry people tend to do after a while. They're behind the stick or they're in the kitchen and they're always kind of thinking, man, if this were my place. Yeah. And we had a few of those conversations play out. And um, we went to a big um, went to a big party in Mexico City in mid-April. And uh, it was a crazy party. Uh, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of industry people there, like Eva Pelkser from from Del Maguey was there, mm-hmm. and La Nina de Mezcala was on hand, and um, it was a lot of fun fun time. Really chaotic. It was yeah. definitely a, a pretty crazy experience in which we you know between the two of us lost like two cell phones, a wallet, <laughs> a key to the <laughs> hostel, you know. And the next day we're like walking down the side of the road to a Walmart where someone can transfer us money so we can pay off our hostel. Yeah. And we're like, dude, I think we work together, right? Like, let's try. Let's see what we can do at a restaurant. Oh man. No business plan. No investors. Um, you know, no menu. No. The spot that I went to, the first spot we checked out to rent, I went there with like the idea of we're gonna check this place out. Let's go figure out what the rent is. I'm gonna mm-hmm. go home. I'm gonna go do my continuing study to keep my certificate. Right. Right. Because I'm not sure if this is the right thing to do or not. So uh, plan B in a way. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm going to go home for six weeks, go see my family before I make this move, write up a business plan, let's figure it out, we'll be in touch. We check into the only place we, we, we see, um, which is what LST Lalo is, uh-huh. and uh, the landlord, who's a really sweet lady, but she put the pressure on. She's like, I don't, she was like, I don't even know if I should show it to you because someone's already agreed to rent the space. Good but, business woman, man. <laughs> um, no, she was actually sincere. Oh, she um, was? Okay. She was sincere. I thought that at first. I was yeah, like, okay, yeah. whatever, you know. Um. Fortunately, at that time, uh, you know, we had a friend at, at the restaurant La Hoya, one of the owners there. We pulled mm-hmm. him over and was like, dude, look at the space. What's the rent? He's like, it's a damn good deal. He's like, pull the trigger if you want this. Yeah. Um, Do you guys have money? Not a lot. Okay. But no, <laughs> like shoestring budget had some, yeah. but no outside investors, like you said, no yeah. business plan, none of that. Yeah, yeah. No, it was a, it was a total whim. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, I'm I'm really fortunate. My dad left me small inheritance, and mm. that on every cent of that went into um, the La Silalo, and, yeah. and 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 Joseph had you know his his he invested as well yeah. um, from his personal account, and um, yeah, we 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 signed the contract and and within and, a day. Uh, I think it was about a week okay, of going okay. back and forth. Yeah, we asked her to give us the keys for a week, and I was I was like, here's five thousand pesos. Like, yeah. give us the, the the keys for a week. Let us think on it. But like, consider this a, like a mini deposit. Sure. You know? Good faith gesture. And uh, we actually started having like funny little like mini parties, like like uh, at the spot, just bringing friends over who people we'd meet. I'm like, hey, come check out the space. You know, we want to put a restaurant here. And um, I wish I could remember who some of those people were. Someone has told me that he's like, man, I remember like four years ago we sat up on the roof like. When you guys just this was just an idea, you oh, know. Oh man! But we started working quickly, and um, that's like I, I try not to live with regrets. But that's one thing where I look back, I'm like, man, I should have taken three more minutes of every day to document where we're at day by day. Because it's such a special time in your life, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. That's um, I think that's such an interesting thing, and I think we have to do that now. And this kind of what so in a way, right? You talking about this moment, I'm brought to this moment. I wasn't even there. So I hope maybe just in some way, just talking about it and kind of <laughs> and just having a nostalgia about it, like brings people back. But man, you probably had a different haircut. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely had a different haircut. There you go. Uh, see? I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I probably wore a baseball cap a lot those days. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't hitting the barber up. Yeah. yeah. It was so, crazy, man. How long then? So you take a week to consider it. You IDA. You guys are thinking. You're throwing parties before that first plate of food is sold to someone you've never met before. How long are we talking? So, Odessi Lalo as we know it, which is a dinner only, tasting menu focused, modern contemporary Mexican spot mm-hmm. um, with, with a really, I'd like to say a killer mezcal program <laughs> and a killer wonder, cocktail wonder why, program would... <laughs> uh, and, a, and, a, and a cool casual rooftop joint on top. Yeah. Um, we didn't get a liquor license on day one, nor do we have it on day 365. I see. Um, so, 60 days after we start running the space... We put together um, first, which are behind closed doors, ring the doorbell, mm-hmm. speakeasy night parties that a lot of industry people would come to. Um, and then we finally, you know, we're literally buying furniture from Mercado de Bastos and sanding it and standing it ourselves. Oh, wow. um, so, you know, like the front bar is in action, it's been built out. The back of the, the kitchen is still not ready. The tables and furniture aren't ready. Mm. But we're like, dude, we've got a bit of mezcal, we've got a ton of craft beer. 
we got to start getting at least our rent paid. Sure. And uh, we scraped and scratched. Um, and then we started opening during the daytime. We literally take down every bottle of booze at night at four or five in the morning. Uh-huh. I was the dumbass who had the policy of we close when you leave. You know, it was never a set closing time. It was sure. like sometimes we close at one in the morning, sometimes we close at five thirty. The good thing is I lived in the back, so I didn't have to walk <laughs> home too far. Um, but that was like you know the, some some of the people who who experienced that and are friends now. It's really yeah. fun to reminisce with them. They're like, man, I remember when we used to show up here at three in the morning and we came over from the crew from Los Ansantes and people from Casa Oaxaca used to come in because it was mm-hmm. like an industry spot. Sure, um, it was like you could drink something good without it being like a karaoke joint or something where like music's thumping too loud. Right, right. Our prices were super reasonable. They were written on a little menu with a like a, a marker mm-hmm. at the end of the day and we go to your table and explain it to you, the mezcal. Um, really, really fun times. And then we'd open up during the day, take all the liquor bottles down and we were a third wave coffee shop oh, no with uh, what's called a comida corrida. Um, it's a three course lunch. Mm. So usually like a salad or a soup, or like an entree and a dessert. For like 90 or 100 pesos mm-hmm. and the people who come in you know we did no advertising people who come in and they'd be like wow like this is really good this is really tasty what is this place even called you don't have a sign we're like yeah. oh we're cafe sin nombre or the cafe without a name uh-huh. and by the way if you like mezcal you should come back at night here's our card ring the doorbell so and if you want a six course tasting menu let us know so like oh man um i think we did our first tasting menu uh joseph was our chef at the time in um mid-july mm. um two chefs from chicago had come down they had just won like a top chef show or whatever they had 10 or fifteen thousand dollars to spend on a vacation right they brought their friends down they heard about us from a place called bulenk uh, which is a, a legendary bakery baker bakery in oaxaca mm. uh, run by some really good friends and they said man if you guys are really want to ball out and have a fun time go eat a men- menu go eat a dinner with these guys super nervous you know it's like they ring the doorbell like holy shit like yeah. here you know and da, 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 what are we gonna do and um it was, it was phenomenal i mean it was something that people really loved we were doing and i need to catch up on the kitchen side at that point i still do mm. and i'm like wow man like joseph's making magical food like i've never seen people react this way to a dinner yeah you know um i think that was when it really clicked and i was like okay this is gonna get some steam and up until that point I honestly kind of thought that it was like, this is going to be something that um, it'll be a, a learning experience. Sure. Like you a know? flash, uh, not a flash in the pan, but I'll get my things out of it, but I'm not expecting it to be a success or embraced. Definitely not my life. Yeah. You know. So um, now it's almost four years later? Or three years Yeah. Later? We'll hit four. Um, we'll hit four in July. Oh, man. So three and a half years later. Yeah. You are different now? Than yeah. When you first started? I mean, everyone is three years later. Yeah. It should be, you know. I mean, uh, it's, you're going back to studies for a second. I, uh, I think the nice thing about college education, what I learned the most was to build a personal ethic. And mm-hmm. one of those things is essentially to, um, you know, what my personal ethic is, is if you're capable of doing something, you need to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, never stop growing, never stop advancing. Yeah. Um, with that said, I had no idea I'd have 24 employees Dude. You know, and, and working yeah. with, um, you know, now 11 families across, you know, literally half of the Mexican Republic. Yeah. Um, but I'm definitely, definitely different. Um, you know, you have to mature pretty quickly. You have to, right? Uh, because in a way now you represent the livelihoods of other people and you can't take that lightly. I mean, not to, <laughs> not yeah. to make it, you know, serious or stern or anything, but in a way... That's just how that kind of works. Yeah. You know? Yeah. All right. I feel comfortable too. That's, I think it's a funny thing. And, that's and a great thing. It's not to say that my day to day is not stressful, mm-hmm. um, you know, and it's not to say that I'm not, uh, um, you know, worried and anxious about, um, you know, everything in terms yeah. of keeping the roof on a, a, a very meticulous restaurant, a mm-hmm. very thoughtful, creative place where we're, we're concerned about everything being perfect yeah. and right. Much more than anyone who walks in the door is. It took sure. me about until about six months ago. I never realized that, um, you know. But uh, and then obviously working with uh, continuing to build really strong relationships with um, small farmers who yeah. need support at the end of the day, and it's it's overwhelming sometimes to think that you know our interactions and is. 
I mean, basically what we're doing is, is a, is a lifeline, you know, yeah. it's a way to say, okay, I've been struggling at this type of thing for almost the entire of my life. And now I'm working with a commercializer who is letting me make mezcal the way I want to make mezcal. And I can count on him to come through mm-hmm. and take care of my needs. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of pressure behind that, I guess. At the end, it of the is. Day. I mean, I feel like being able to compartmentalize is quite a good thing because all these projects, all these different families, you know, I said, geez, over 20 families or whatnot, and you have to just kind of take it one step at a time and not let the pressure get to you. You've got to launch a brand in Texas. You get all these different things. So let's, you know, let's take the, the stress out of it and kind of all of these things that are going on, this amazing restaurant, and then, of course, this beautifully curated section of Mezcal. So when is Cinco Sentidos, when is that idea born? And you said, you know what? I need a label. I need my own stash. That was almost immediately. It was, okay. Um, in fact, when we... When we started renting the space, um, we gave the keys to a contractor for 60 days and said, mm-hmm. here's our ideas. We'll see you in two months. And Joseph and I launched off on a road trip of, you know, deep in the cuts, Oaxaca, yeah. um, Puebla, Jalisco, Michoacan, and also some Mexico City for some R&D inspiration. Cool. And a 1996 Jeep Grand, Grand Cherokee with 200,000 miles. What on. color was it? It was red. It was okay. like ruby red, man. We had one of those. It was gold. It was like champagne color. You remember that one? This thing got like 10 miles to the gallon. Yeah. One of the door panels fell off on the highway. Michigan. I'll never <laughs> forget that moment, man. The door panel just like falls off, like, you know, like the lower panel. Uh-huh. And like we pull over on the side of the road and, and uh, we, like, you know, kind of pop our heads out. And someone's like, Yasi le llevaron. There's like, so, like someone already picked it up and ran with it, dude. It was like, who wants our door panel, man? It was like a, it was like a mini lesson of like, yeah. man, things are different out here. Yeah, you know? dude. Oh, um, man. But uh, you know, we go through this and, and we meet Pedro Jimenez and Amazonte. Yeah. Um, you know, to this day, I've never had a more profound tasting or uh, right. interaction with somebody. It's like a spirit, like he's like a true shaman, you know, like that he just leads you through this voyage, but without judgment, with just open arms. That experience to me too was really revelatory in the sense that I didn't know at that time still that I really wanted to get involved with mezcal. Yeah. What I knew and what Joseph uh, and I both knew was that we wanted to get mezcales that were not the same as everyone who was serving in Oaxaca. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why we went to Puebla. That's why we went to Jalisco. That's why we went to Michoacan. And I'm looking some stuff up and trying to find out what's out there. Yeah. I'm um, like, oh, I just want to bring something a little different to the table. You know, obviously that's what a restaurant concept is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so it just mirrors that. And at that time, you know, that was the idea, the motivator. And, you know, fortunately, Clayton Sheck. Um, Clayton, yeah. That connected us, connected us with, with Pedro. And I met, ironically, I met Clayton when I was interpreting for a tour at Ramonero. No um, way. And he like pulled me aside because I think I knew the word for equello or something like that. Oh. Or there was like a really obscure agave word. And he's like, dude, like, you know the word for that? Like, who are you? You know? And I was like, oh, I'm just a guy who's, I guess I'm going to open a restaurant. I don't know. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. And uh, so, you know, I hit him up saying, we're going to go to tequila. We want to see what that's about. Um, and he's like, make sure you meet Pedro. Oh, man. Meet Pedro and have incredible tasting in the back of my mind it's like you know i want to get involved in this yeah i want to try and do what pedro jimenez is doing um and he's an expert in his field and especially the regional mezcales that he's working on he's very clearly someone who's devoted to the ethical co- uh, portion of the, of the business side of things mm-hmm. and then at the end of the day promoting culture um culture history and tradition and you know, i walk away from there you know a different person that, that night um Continue our road trip. We come back. You know, bar's not built out yeah. as we expected. You know, the whole contractor and the keys thing was a bad idea. But sure. we had this really cool. You know, we got to, we got to visit uh, Miguel Angel Partida, who's makes Chacolo, um, Arturo Campos, who makes one of the Venenosa labels. Mm. Um, a few producers in Puebla popped onto Michoacan. Um, got to see all this really crazy cool stuff, and it was like you know we had a sixty day uh, crash course and sure. how crazy different everything is. And I come back to the Estilado and I go, cool, I want Cinco Sentidos because I want people to know this isn't a smoky tequila. Mm. And there's not just Esperin and Dobala. There's Filipino stills and there's clay pot stills and there's underground fermentation. And there's people, I mean, there's people fermenting in raw hide. There's people making moles with iguana, or like moles and their pachugas yeah, and yeah. with iguana and all this crazy stuff that that isn't at that time still yet common knowledge. But we just got a piece of, like, we got to taste it, you know? 
Um, we get a piece of the action, if you will. We got to yeah. see what's happening. So Cinco Sentidos is something that comes from like, all right, we're going to work with small producers with a, a leaning towards obscure production techniques. Uh, I see. So not an emphasis on emphasis on the, the, the double distillation copper alembic with the fermenting and, and pine, right? Right. Um, which is still some of the most incredible, beautiful mezcals that I've had a taste. And, mm. and one of those mezcals is part of our line. You know, it's part of the conversation, like a, like a copper still uh, uh, distillation. But it was at that point, it was like, I want to be off the beaten path. You yeah. know, I want to do unusual things. And it took about two years, maybe, maybe about a year and a half, I guess, where I felt good about the like the micro purchases we were making with producers 20 yeah. or 30 liters you know for our restaurant intentionally paying you know a, a higher than average market rate right um inquisitive promotional and um i started seeing some of our bottles online like being sold and people straight kept saying when are you going to export when are you oh, going to really? export and i didn't want to do it for a long time I, I think the the liquor industry like the booze industry in general was something that was like i don't know if that's not the type of person I am, yeah. you know, because I think if you're an outsider to this thing, like you think that there's just, uh, I don't know, it feels more like business and less like, uh, like holistic, like what we were doing. Right. Like, yeah. I like the idea of being behind the bar night in and night out sharing with people who walked in the door. Right. Not having an invoicing and having to say, these are the sales goals and all that and dealing with yeah. the tiered system. Ugh. And, and now, um, it was something that kind of hit, you know, the nail on the head too. And one of the producers is hitting me up like, Hey man, like, you know, I've got like a hundred liters of something. Can you buy it for me? And it's like, you know what? Paying someone 30%, 20% more than what they're asking for, for a bottle of, for 20 liters of mezcal is not making an impact in their life. Yeah. If I can commit to their production and make sure that they don't feel like they need to look for a market that needed, that needed a taxi into Oaxaca with no cash and Mm -hmm. 20 liters of mezcal hoping that someone will buy it for them so they can go home and, and make a purchase on a piece of equipment or, you know, get cool supplies. Um, let's stop keeping the producers that like that I'm working with in that that state of uncertainty. Yeah. Um, and I think at that point, you know, I'd, I knew enough about a few of the people we're working with to go, I'm going to approach them about this and see if they're interested in this idea, you know, yeah. of, of, um, of letting me be their bridge to a larger market, not just a not just a restaurant brand, right? Um, you, you know what's interesting? So last night, this this tasting at King Bee, which was a really rousing success for them. Six marks the six you've brought into Texas, and I can I remember I memorized them last night. So, so <laughs> you know, you go through those, and you go backwards and forwards, and really, really lovely stuff. I mean, it it is such a wide swath of different kinds of flavors and textures. What you've done, the Madre Quiche. Quiche blend is one of my favorite quiches I've ever had. That Tobalao is exceptional, the, the Pachuga, all of this. But the thing is, you taste this and you're like, this is mezcal. But by all purposes of law, it's not. Mm-hmm. And is this, I, I, because I have no problem with it, because to me, good distillate's good distillate. I don't care if it's Tracia or Sotol or whatever, right? This stuff is fucking brilliant and it's very, very delicious and it's made very, very well, which. I think it's a testament to maybe your ability to taste things and kind of bring those. But the fact that it's not mezcal, even though it is mezcal, right? It's like parenthetical in a way. Mm -hmm. Was that a business choice? Was that fighting for the financial freedom of the producers? What was really the ethos there in choosing not to get it all, you know, certified, I guess you could say? Well, every producer has a different story to a certain degree. Um, But most of them have something in common, which is, if I wanted to go through the certification process for the spirits that they produce, mm-hmm. um, I would be the person telling them to make some changes uh-huh. how they make things. And uh, at that point in time where we were at, I didn't feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, so we did our lab tests in a few batches, and um, you know we find that uh, that one of the producers is hitting 315, 315 parts per million methanol. Mm-hmm. And the CRM, the Consejo Regular de Mezcal, mandates it's 300 parts per million. Oh, man. Yeah. And this producer has gone through this process with another commercializer before me who eventually walked away mm-hmm. and said, your mezcal doesn't hit the lab tests. Um, 
315 parts per million methanol is not something that's, it's not a magical cutoff at 300. Right. Like if you drink some of the 305, you drop dead. Yeah, it's, you know. it's completely arbitrary. Um, and, and there are spirits that are legally commercialized at international international level that have over 1,000 parts per methanol. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, essentially from methanol to, to, to poison you, 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 you're already in a bad state before. Yeah, right. Unless you're drinking 100% puntas, uh-huh. heads, you know. If you're drinking a, a liter of straight heads off the still, that's that's some risky behavior. Yeah, yeah, but this is not what we're doing. This is not what we what we have. Um, for one of those producers in particular, um, he tends to make very wide cuts. He goes mm. deep into his tails. Um, he's got his spirits are always 44, 45 percent alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how people in his town like to drink mezcal. Yeah, and I'm having a conversation with him. His name is Amando. He's a 28 year old distiller. Is it the popular mental? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's a, he's a, he's a peer. Um, he's my friend. Yeah, and. We're having a conversation about this idea of, hey, I want to bring this to the States. and You're going to have to start going through this paperwork process. and You're going to have to start making your... And the thing is, I sent this to the lab and, you know, you've known me now for two years. And, and I, you're the first bottle I put in front of people when they walk into my restaurant because of how unique and special your process is. Mm-hmm. Fermenting in rawhide, you've got this totally, essentially a pre-Hispanic palenque where there's, there's, there's no plastic. There's very, very little metal. Yeah. Um, you know, they're using... Palm, the roof is made out of palm. Mm. Um, they're using cantera for the floor and uh, wooden mallets to mash with. They're bringing water in through fallen quiotes and trees. Wow. And I'm here telling this guy who has made this an architectural masterpiece of an homage to how mezcal was made 500 years ago, saying that there's a chemical compound here that you might not even be familiar with, mm. and we can't call it mezcal because of that. So how do we change your process? And halfway through that conversation, it's like, I'm not going to tell a sixth generation producer how to make what he's been taught how to make since he was 10 years old. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that conversation switched to, what are our alternatives? Um, you know, we know that Destilado de Gabe and nowadays Aguariente de Gabe exists in Oaxaca. Mm-hmm. And every reputable mezcaleria commercializes their spirits that way. Mezcaloteca does. Mm-hmm. In situ does. In situ, yeah, definitely. Um, mezcalogia does. And I started looking at that, going, "Well, why? Oh, because those are small batches. Because there's a lot. Those are, you know, those are unique, mm-hmm. small things that um, are expensive and difficult to certify." Um, and just started researching about how do, how can I be a conduit to to the market, doing what you want to do, yeah, without having you change the things you're going to do, and all of a sudden bring an inspector out and 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 observe your process and sign off on it. Um, yeah, it's a weird thing to say, well, no, we're going to tell you what tradition is. It's like, well, you can't do that. You can't legislate well, it, you know? That, and, 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 and that's where all um, denominations of origin exist for a reason. They protect people, places, customs, sure. and traditions. Um, and I'm pro denomination of origin. It just isn't the right fit for the producers I'm working with. Gotcha, yeah. Um, but I think that it makes sense. It, it does make sense for mezcal to have denomination of origin, and I think it's incredibly important mm. for how the industry has been able to establish itself in the past ten years by, by, um, you know, by basically making labeling standards, by yeah. making a baseline set of quality standards. Um, yeah, there's definitely you're right, and that is for the industry at large and people that have the means, you know. But I think with some of these folks, is you know that Madre Quiche blend, the Piquiche, that was like 120 liters or something, mm-hmm. right. super super small. And in a way, there's no point in even, because it's never going to be like that again. You're going to get that batch, right? And that was a snapshot of a certain place in time, certain flavor. And then you're gonna they're going to move on to something else based on what they've got. So in a way, it's kind of just letting, I think it's like the creative liberties are super wide. And I, I think that's what I appreciated about those mezcalas is the, just the massive shades of flavor that I had never experienced in that particular way for so i think that's the right way to do it and i think it adds to the discussion do people give you a hard time about it in the states um i'm gonna paraphrase a friend yeah that told me this in san antonio a few days ago and we had this conversation about is there a hard time about it and it was actually really alleviating because he goes you know people don't like shit that's not theirs (laughs) um so it's uh i've gotten a bit of a, a pushback from it and um you know, from a personal standpoint, that hurts when yeah. sometimes it's a friend saying, I don't agree with your business decisions or, um, 
And from a professional standpoint, our brand exists so the producers we work with have a steady source of income right. and can be empowered to make mezcal the way they've always wanted to make mezcal. And that's a greater cause than anybody giving you shit about it, dude. Um, yeah. You know, not, but you're right. If like if they ain't you, they hate you or whatever. There's some fucking terminology and that's whatever. If that's how it's going to be. Yeah, it's it's something that it, it, it bothered me much more and uh, a different friend at a different time and place. Said, yeah. hey, do, you leave, do you believe in your project? Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's enough. Yeah, for you know? sure. Um, you don't need to satisfy everybody. So, you know, I'll post, I took some pictures of the event last night and then again, these six bottles that came in and you're kind of doing it differently around the nation, which I like, stuff that's scarce. You're not artificially inflating demand or driving. It's like, if I only have so much of this one thing, only this one place can get it reasonably. I think that's a really respectful way to do it because again, dude, these are like live performances that someone bootlegs. You know what I mean? That's because that's what it is. It's totally what it is. Because it's like it'll never be that same show again. It never yeah. will. Like you know, with, whether it's fucking fish, Pearl Jam, like there's all these Fugazi. So that's what I kind of look at this like. It's like these are the live recordings, and you'd be lucky if you ever got something that was remotely the same again. Because it's all just inspirational in that particular moment in time. So that's what I think about these bottles. And then having the chance to sip them with you and then with Billy and all the folks who can be last night, that's a moment that I will not be able to recreate, but that's okay. And I like it. And that makes me excited about the future bottles that come in. So I got a couple questions left for you. Mm-hmm. Cause I think this has been a really good chat. And I really appreciate the story because now I kind of get you more, which is always something I'm thankful for to understand the heart of the folks that are bringing these, bringing the heart of other folks to the market. If you think about it. So, What's next then now? So you're here till Wednesday in Austin, then you're heading back to Oaxaca City? Um, actually, I'm heading to Michoacan. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. So, um, new project or same project, new um, skew? No, it's a bit more. I'm going with an open mind. So I'm yeah. traveling with a friend there um, who every year we, we, we travel in a, in a part of Mexico where we haven't been mm-hmm. to mezcal producing regions to see what's happening so we can learn more. Yeah. Um, I'm certainly interested in seeing. I, I I I went briefly in December and popped out to a couple of producers, and I'm intrigued. Um, but the logistics of working with Michoacano producers on my homes in Oaxaca is is uh, it's probably a little too much to tackle. Oh yeah. Um, but I'm certainly you know I'm going out there to, to have a good time, and then actually that trip is a, like we have a four day mezcal road trip, and then my mom's coming down afterwards. We're going to oh, check the, the Monarch Reserve, go to Pátzcuaro, um, so just have. You know, I haven't had a family vacation with her in a couple of years, yeah. so going to hang out with her for for a few days. Which oh, that's be a lot great! Of fun. That's yeah. super great. So the rest of February is looking pretty fun. Good uh, personal yeah. time back, kind of relax yeah. a little bit. I think yeah, that's yeah. important. Yeah. Well, yeah. so we're sipping. You know, we're sipping this hobbly. You know, we could keep in touch with all the stuff that's going to be coming out. I dude, there's going to be no shortage of labels that come to Texas now. I just I can see those wheels spinning, and you're going to different states and things. But this hobbly is really it's astonishing. It's one of the greater hobblies I've had. I do have. Um, we're risking it here because we're on the air. Yeah, you haven't tried this, but I do have something that's gonna that is a, that is um, a representation of a of another side project that is coming soon. Oh, really? Um, so we can either taste that off air or on air. But well, uh, do you want? Do you care to mention it? Do you want to talk about it? Yeah, What's, yeah. I think let's. Um, I haven't actually spoken this out loud to anyone, so oh. it's kind of cool. But, yeah, um, cr- I I feel privileged to be able to. We're we're thinking in in May, maybe June. I'm gonna release a small line of. Um, uh, kind of bottled under the uh, La Colección Mixteca, mm. so the Mixteca collection. So I spent a lot of time traveling around the Mixteca Poblana, the Mixteca Oaxaqueña, mm. Baja y Alta, um, and I found some really, really, really rustic producers. Um, I've been serving some other spirits in my restaurant for over a year, year oh, and a half. Oh, cool. Um, but we're making headway in terms of um, preparing them for export, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll be bringing some kind of obscure... Um, agaves that are not really well known. Um, some of the production process it's incredibly rustic, but I stand by it. Yeah. I mean, there's a guy who we're working with who, uh, if you tasted it, you wouldn't know that he's using a, like an old galvanized steel barrel as a still. No you know? shit. And it's one of the most refined spirits you've had. It's 14 yeah. days old, and I think it's bonkers. Crazy. Um, and I think that'll be really neat. I'm really excited to kind of you know shed a light on some other regions um and production practices that are unknown yeah um, or haven't yet made it outside of really the communities where they're at um 
and it's kind of like you know El Destilado the restaurant mm-hmm. financed Cinco Sentidos you know with Cinco Sentidos we're going to be able to start at this Mixteca a collection Mixteca project yeah um, and and I'm excited to, to, to not focus or shift but just put a bit more emphasis on some other things that aren't that, that no one's really working with or doing or Man, talking about multiple states um, Puebla and Oaxaca right now very cool um, so part of the Mixteca st- stretches into Guerrero but um, I don't know not yet. Going to Guerrero yet yeah <laughs> yeah no I don't have a Guerrero is a tough place to get into yeah that's what I hear um, but yeah this is something that, that, that we should be bringing in relatively soon so I'm, I'm psyched about that too. yeah that's amazing yeah. More rusticity, more esoteric process, perhaps things that have seldom been unearthed yeah. to the states. Really, yeah. I think that's great. It's an Indiana Jones kind of thing. <laughs> these relics, these artifacts. We're gonna have to try this. What's so? We'll try it off the mic. But what is this yeah. first one that you've? Um, so it is a co-fermented blend of papalome and pichumel. Oh, papalome in that region okay. are going to be um, either cupriatas or potaturums. Mm. So walking around with a tello and asking him to show me to him what's a papalome. Um, they're two different morphological species. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're both the butterfly agave. Yeah, you know, yeah. The, the metal papalote. Uh, it's essentially what, for him, that's that's a, that's a that type of agave. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a pichumel is what people in Oaxaca would call a tepextate. Um, but it's uh, a little bit smaller, has a shorter lifespan. Mm. It is a mamorata. It's classified as a mamorata. Um, yeah, it's a co-fermented blend. It's a 122 liter batch. Oh man! He distilled it 15 days ago. Um, I went down with uh, Michael Ru- Michael Rubel and um, Sam Carlson. So Michael Rubel runs a stereo in Chicago. Oh, Sam yeah. Carlson runs Doves. And uh, the three of us did a little road trip through Puebla, and we went there right when he finished distilling, and he was, he blended on site with us, oh, and cool. checking and tasting, and um, it's really funny, you know. Um, I've talked a lot with my friends in the industry about how Cinco Sentidos is a non-interventionist brand. Yeah. Um, I try, I mean, I deflect the conversation of, do you want this to be proofed up? Do you want this to be proofed down? What agave do you want me to make you? Mm -hmm. Um, And the answer is always in some form, it's I'd like you to keep making mezcal the way you made mezcal before we ever met. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't want to have an influence. I don't think I could do anything to make your spirits better. Right. Um, and the Mixteca collection has been a little more collaborative, if you will. Oh, cool. Or in, okay. I, in the idea, at least in theory. It is. Yeah, yeah. So we went there and we proofed and we're tasting and we're going back and forth and smelling and tasting. And me and Michael are both like, yeah, like this would be cool if it were like, you know, like, like natch it up like half a point, you know? And I thought I was like, no, that's good how it is. <laughs> I was like, all right, we're going to be not adventurous at the end of the day after all. So, that's so I mean, it's the master's choice at the end of the day. It's the master's blend. Yeah, I think um, that's great. I think it, again, pays homage to the tradition and to the men themselves. And yeah, like and and I think that's what, 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 you know, we kind of like, you know, you take a step back and go, who the hell am I to tell you what to do? Yeah, that's this a good point. You're right. It's incredible how it is. Yeah, um, why mess was a good thing. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, so my last question for you before you're kind of off to this great February here with your mom. Your mom. <laughs> this blend is Papalome or Papalome? Papalome and yeah. Pichamel. Yeah. Which, you know, I, thanks for t- telling me how to say it. I've been kind of rubbing the CH together. But you can sip this mark with anybody in anywhere in the world, living or deceased, who might you like to just sit there and have a good dram of this with? Um, I'm not sure I'd pick this bottle. Mm. but Interesting. Okay. Um, I would definitely, I want to know that I want to sit down and drink mezcal with the people or person who started this thing Mm. 500 years ago, who had the curiosity, you know, who was the first family or brothers or father and son team that said, yeah, I think we can make booze from this. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I think it'd be a very fascinating thing. You'd learn a whole lot about the real inspiration and ideas behind this and you know that's an, an, an absolutely fascinating person yeah. at the end of the day. Um, Where it all began. Who, exactly. You know, yeah. who, someone who's gone out on a limb and tried something that no one else has ever tried and um, in the pursuit of something different yeah. and refined and powerful. And uh, that, that to me would be the, but who knows? I mean, we don't know who that person was. Yeah. Um, and it'd be, it'd be, I think it'd be a fun exchange, you know, to know where, or what, how that legacy is perceived today. Yeah. 
look what you started and where it's the at. present we, connecting we with the past that. yeah that's an interesting way to look at it um, well i think that's brilliant i think it'd be a great conversation and yeah. <laughs> maybe it would be a simple answer or maybe something far more cerebral yeah it's hard to say but it's been great having you in austin man and getting to hang out with you a couple nights and thanks i'm glad that this stuff is in town now and it's really really lovely and i think that sipping through all six i mean the the thing for me is that they're all so different you will find one that you love there is yeah. no doubt now i don't know which one it is and i'm glad that it's been different for every single person i talked to last night that's what this is all about the colors the diversity the people expressing their personalities about we're all very very different internally so this is the one way that we can see that too is this their voice in the bottle you know so thanks so much for sitting down and chat i will have to take you up on a pub visit here sooner or later yeah please come through thanks jason thank you so there we have it mr jason paul cox El Jefe at El Destilado in Oaxaca and the purveyor creator of Cinco Sentidos, an amazing collection of agave distillates from multiple states throughout Mexico. And he's got a new project. You know, there's a lot of new Mexican rum coming to the states. And Cañada is a new concept from Jason. You see that stuff popping up here really soon. And a Mixteca collection. Again, some the finest that's the lot of day of guys I've ever had all in one place. And it's kind of a new special limited edition from Jason's brand. So it's good getting to know him. He is a very outspoken guy, even though in this conversation, he may seem a little timid, which is probably far from the truth, but Pop by El Destilado next time you're in Oaxaca. It's an amazing culinary experience. So Jason, thanks so much for sitting down and chatting with me. And thanks everybody for listening to Show to V with Mike G. No matter how weird the transition is to a visual program versus an audio only program, or if you're thinking Mystery Science Theater 3000, I really miss that show. Please keep dancing. Mm-hmm.